Jim Lark. Uh, I am a professor in, I'm, they've created a new position for me. I'm uh, in the Department of Systems and Information Engineering and the Department of Statistics at the University of Virginia. I also have the honor of serving as advisor to the Liberty Coalition at the University of Virginia, which is the umbrella group that we have for our various libertarian student organizations. And what I'd like to discuss with you today is a uh, it's a talk that is entitled Challenges to Liberty, Substantive Criticisms and Questions Concerning the Libertarian Perspective. And I hope you will enjoy the show. Let me get my trusty keyboard here. And let's see. Page up and page down. All right. I'd like to thank the officers of Madison Liberty for the invitation to come over here. I certainly appreciate the kindness and hospitality that I've always received. What I'll do is give you a little information about me. I'll make some general comments about improving the ability of liberty activists to promote the ideas of liberty. The second bullet point is something that I've gotten in the habit of tossing in whenever I have the chance to talk to liberty activists, because uh, I like to emphasize the point. Then I'll go on to a brief discussion of some issues that I feel are extremely important for us to, to address, some substantive criticisms of the libertarian perspective, and then I'll be happy to entertain your questions and comments. By the way, I apologize for my lack of sartorial splendor this evening. Usually when I come to address such an august group, I would be in suit and tie, but for various reasons I've been <laughs> running around like a chicken with its head re removed, and so I've been rushing pillar to post, and so I didn't have the opportunity to get properly attired. So I hope that you don't consider my lack of sartorial elegance a, uh, a slight toward this august assemblage. <laughs> Uh, as mentioned, again, I'm a uh, <coughs> professor in statistics and systems information engineering, took my BS in math at Virginia Tech, though I was actually a physics major up until my last quarter, took my union card, my PhD in systems engineering. In a previous lifetime, I was a visiting scholar, visiting schmuck at the Center for the Study of Public Choice when it was still at Virginia Tech. Of course, it's now at George Mason University. I had the honor of serving as the Earhart Foundation visiting fellow at the Center for Research and Government Policy and Business at the University of Rochester. Uh, I mentioned I'm the advisor and founder of the Liberty Coalition at UVA. I have the honor of serving on the Board of Advisors for Students for Liberty. Mr. Rudman mentioned the upcoming um, conference in Philadelphia. I'm on the Board of Advisors for the organization that's sponsoring it. I have the honor of chairing the Board of Directors of the Advocates for Self-Government, if you're familiar with the world's smallest political quiz. Uh, that's an Operation Politically Homeless. That's our organization. And then I serve as Secretary of the Board of Directors of the International Society for Individual Liberty. As mentioned, I do have some passing familiarity and association with the Libertarian Party. I'm on the Libertarian National Committee. Um, I'm also on the Executive Committee of the LNC. And as uh, Ms. Schimmel mentioned, I'm, I served as excuse me, Chairman of the Libertarian Party uh, during the 2000-2002 term. They couldn't find anyone good, so they got stuck with me. Uh, I, I, I put this up here because, frankly, I'm kind of proud of this. I've won the, the Adams, Payne, and Jefferson Awards, and I, frankly, am kind of proud of that. Uh, so I just put it up here, and you can, you can deal with it if you will. The triple crown? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, the only, I'm the only triple winner, so uh, yay me. Um, I mentioned I, I put up a couple of general comments. For those of you who are interested in, in explaining and promoting the libertarian perspective, a couple of very simple points. In fact, I, I hope when you hear me mention these, you'll say, why is he belaboring the obvious? Always treat people with courtesy and respect and observe the highest standards of intellectual integrity. If we want to explain and promote these ideas, we have to apply the same withering scrutiny to our own ideas that we apply to the ideas of those with whom we ostensibly disagree. Um, intellectual sloppiness is no more appealing when it comes from supposed libertarians than it comes from people with whom we're, we're carrying on arguments. And also, just treat people with courtesy and respect. The fact that people don't immediately embrace the ideas of individual liberty coupled with personal responsibility does not mean that they're stupid, venal bastards. It just means that maybe they have a different perspective on things. Reasonable people can look at the same evidence that we see and they can come to different conclusions. So just treat people with courtesy and respect. And you'll be amazed, well, you might not be amazed, but I think you'll be pleased at the extent to which if people, if you treat people the right way, they'll usually listen to you. They may not agree with you, but they'll usually at least listen to you, and that's really all you can hope for. 
the purpose of my spiel this evening is to identify some of the challenges that I feel are of particular importance regarding the libertarian perspective. There are various issues that our friends and neighbors may have with the libertarian perspective. And I think we need to understand what those weaknesses, potential weaknesses of our perspective happen to be, and we need to be able to try to address them. So I hope that, uh, I suspect that many of you have already seen these ideas, or at least thought about them a little bit. Um, if we want to, we want to move forward to a libertarian society, I think we have to be able to address these issues. Now, many of the challenges that I'll discuss are applicable basically to any political system. It's not just the libertarian perspective. Many of these challenges will apply. In fact, in some cases, criticisms of the libertarian perspective apply even more strongly to the other conceivable alternative institutional arrangements uh, against which we're competing in the battle of ideas. When I talk about the end of it, when I talk about the libertarian perspective, let me let me give you an idea of what I actually mean by that. I take as axiomatic some principles, one of which is the right to self-ownership. In other words, that I have, I own my own body, that no one has a claim on my body parts or my actions. I also believe in the right to own that which I have produced with my own labor and property. In other words, if I have my own property and I mix that property with my labor and create something, that something is mine. It belongs to me. And the third point that I mentioned is that I believe in a right to acquire and own that which was heretofore unowned. And I use the phrase homesteading. In other words, if there's property which has not been owned, um, I believe that it is, it is appropriate, uh, or at least it is morally justifiable, to claim that property, or at least some fraction thereof. I also believe that the rights that I talk about, these rights, these axioms to which I agree, rights exist prior to the formation of government. In other words, governments do not create rights. Rights exist prior to the formation of government, that we form governments to protect our rights. In other words, we band together to form these things called governments for the purpose of protection of pre-existing rights. And if a government violates the very rights that it was ostensibly established to protect, the citizens have the right to alter, or as Mr. Jefferson would say, abolish that government. My notion of what the libertarian perspective is proceeds from these <coughs> axioms and principles. From my experience, most self-identified libertarians, and indeed most people, tend to agree with the first two axioms, self-ownership and the right. If you have, if you own property and you mix it with your labor, you own that which is produced. The third axiom, the notion about ownership of property, is one with which a lot of people will have disagreement. And even among libertarians, in fact, one might even say particularly among self-identified libertarians, there are frequently disagreements as to how you justify ownership of property, particularly real property. So when I use the phrase libertarian perspective, please, uh, please allow me a certain degree of latitude because it is not clear that everyone would, including self-identified libertarians, would say, yes, what Dr. Lark is talking about is the libertarian perspective. So I will, I will be a little bit pretentious here when I talk about the libertarian perspective, and I hope you will allow me that little bit of pretentiousness. Also, when I use the term government, not everybody will necessarily agree with what, what the term government means, and we can get into more fine distinctions if we need to. When I look at these, these particular challenges, uh, again, I think that they're important. They are not the only ones that are worthy of discussion. And what I'm going to do with my little conversation with you here, I'm not really going to do justice to any of these. We could go into great depth with respect to all of these. Each one of these challenges is arguably worth its own lecture or discussion. Again, I suspect many of you have already thought about some of these ideas, so perhaps uh, this will seem old hat to you, and if so, I apologize, although I still hope it will be interesting to you. By the way, I am not going to pick as the challenges that I want to discuss. I have not picked the ones that I think are the ones we can easily answer. In other words, I didn't engage in cherry picking to pick only the ones that I thought libertarians can, can answer. It's not that I went through and said, all right, we can handle these, the other ones we can't handle. 
So I didn't engage in any sort of check, uh, any sort of cherry picking in this case. All right, the first challenge which I consider truly fundamental is the issue of ownership of land. All right, how do you justify ownership of real property? And if you can own, if you can justify its ownership, what are the conditions? Under what circumstances? What are the conditions? How do you justly acquire the land, and how do you indicate that you have acquired it? How do you indicate that it's yours? How do you mark it? Do you actually have to chop down trees? Do you actually have to dig a ditch? Do you have to put a fence around it? If I own land, do I own it in perpetuity, absent some sort of transfer, free and voluntary transfer with others? And if I can own it, do I, uh, do I own it in perpetuity, absent purposeful action to maintain it? In other words, do I have to show some sign that I'm actually using it? If I, if I claim the meadow, even if we can agree that, yes, this is my meadow, do I have to take some purposeful action to indicate I'm using the meadow over some period of time? If I don't, do I lose, do I lose ownership? Or perhaps relinquish, if not total ownership, do I relinquish certain claims upon that property. Various questions arise from this, okay? To what extent can I say, you can't come on my property? Or you can't perhaps fly over my property? And incidentally, if I fly over the property, or somebody else flies over my property, does it matter at what altitude? In other words, if a plane, if, a, if an F-18 buzzes me at, you know, 20 feet, after I manage to regain my continence, because I probably wet myself, <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard an F-18 going over. They make a lot of noise. Um, you know, do I? Have, what what action can I take? Is it different if a guy flies over my? Let's say a jet airliner flies over a passenger airliner flies over 35,000 feet. Okay. What if I own a meadow and somebody simply wants to walk across the meadow? They're not going to drive a tank across it. They're not going to do any damage. They're just going to walk across the meadow because they want to get to their meadow. Do I have the right to prohibit them simply from egressing here to there? All right. Do I have subsidence rights? If I own the meadow, let's say we all agree I own the meadow, do I have the right to that, to that pool of water or that pool of oil or that vein of coal under my property? Okay. And let's say I've got this pool of water. Do I have the right to suck out as much as I can as quickly as I can? Incidentally, I first started giving these ideas serious consideration about 32, 33 years ago when the comedian Gallagher, you may have seen him, he's now come back on Geico commercials. He's got, you know, you've heard of the Vegematic? Well, he has the Sledgematic, where he would take a sledgehammer and bash a watermelon. So you see Gallagher, you know. Some people are easily amused. I'm one of them, and so I was easily amused by his bashing watermelons. Well, at the time of the second Arab oil embargo in 1979, the comedian Gallagher was talking about the fact that we have this oil embargo. By the way, this was at a time where if you were in California and your license plate ended with an even number, you could only get gasoline on certain days. If your license plate ended in an odd number, you could only get gasoline on certain days. So the price of, the price of petroleum at the pump had gone very high by those standards. And the comedian Gallagher posed the question. You know, he's talking about the Saudi Arabians. He, he was personifying all who owned oil, you know, as Saudi Arabians. And he said, what makes it their oil? Why don't we just drill a big hole, hole and suck it out from under them? And, you know, he started thinking about that. And, okay, eh, that's an interesting question. And by the way, for those of you who don't know a little history, when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, which was the proximate event which generated the American response in the first Gulf War, it was because the Iraqis claimed the Kuwaitis were drilling down on a diagonal and sucking oil out from under their, their territorial uh, property. So uh, these, are, these are actually, they may seem a little, they may seem a little <coughs> comical in ways, but these are actually very serious questions. Um, by the way, water rights issues are huge issues in the, in, in, in the Israel-Palestine issue. Who gets the water? In fact, one of the biggest problems for the Palestinians claims that the Israelis are stealing their water. Even if we come to some sort of agreement that we can own property, what about the current owners of the property? Do they own it? Some of you may remember Blazing Saddles, the film Blazing Saddles, where, where Slim Pickens is complaining that we go to the time and trouble to slaughter every Indian 
and then they appoint a sheriff to Rock Ridge that's darker than any Indian, and he was depressed. You know, the, the people who now have the property, is it really their property? And if so, by what standards? If the current owners don't have the property, don't own the property, who does? Okay, so there, there are some very serious questions here. By the way, a, a lot of fascinating questions arose once the Iron Curtain fell and you had communist governments basically be dissolving in Eastern Europe, a lot of people went back to claim their property, which had been expropriated by the communist government. And some people raised the legitimate question, well, how did they get the property? Did they benefit because, for example, the governments in power, say, in East Germany, at the time had been the Nazi government, and maybe that property had been stolen from Jews who got shipped to a concentration camp to transfer to the people who now want to come back and claim their property. So there are lots and lots of sticky questions that we can, we can brood about. Many people who criticize what I view as a sort of the libertarian perspective on private property ownership, in some cases they simply question the morality of any private property ownership. They say basically all land essentially has some sort of common ownership that is not proper for anyone to monopolize property. And by the way, with, even within what I would call the general libertarian family, there are a lot of people who are, I think, are properly libertarian adjective, not necessarily libertarian noun, but sort of libertarian in their outlook, who have very strong objections to what most self-identified libertarians claim as justification for property. Um, if you have a Lockean notion of property, then uh, basically the idea that you can mix property with your labor and it becomes yours. If you didn't create the earth, how can you claim a piece of property? How can you claim that you, you, this is your property? Some of the criticisms are essentially prudential in nature, practical in nature. For example, the idea that if you allow private ownership, eventually it will lead to the immiseration of the masses. In other words, you'll allow, or at least you allow for the possibility that the wealthy will buy up the property or acquire it in some fashion, leading to mass immiseration, or that you will have a situation, which some people would say is the same thing, where those who don't own property have to work for those who do. And essentially, even though it's not literally serfdom or slavery, it looks like you know, it looks a lot like both of them. The issue of property ownership and justification of real property, I consider this to be fundamental. In fact, I refer to this as the dirty little secret of libertarianism, because we libertarians, in many cases, don't agree on how do you properly justify ownership of property. And sometimes we can be a little snotty in terms of dealing with people who are avowed not libertarians in terms of our discussions. And when you look at the various ways in which people try to justify ownership of property, I've given a fair amount of thought to this. I haven't found any notion of private property that I find completely satisfactory, including my own. My own, my own philosophy has its problems. I think those problems are less bad than the problems you're likely to encounter with other philosophical systems, but mine's not completely satisfactory either. It's the best I've got for the moment. I mentioned, by the way, there are other perspectives within the general sort of libertarian framework uh, that I think are, are, are interesting. The Georgist perspective, for example, the idea of using a land tax that basically nobody has the right to complete outright ownership of property but essentially, you do have the right to, in a sense, rent the property and the idea of the so-called land tax, that there should be one tax, it should be a tax on the value of land. I find this a very interesting way of going about I don't consider myself a Georgist, but I find the perspective to be a very interesting one, and I think one with which libertarians, or thoughtful libertarians, should be familiar. <clears throat> the second challenge is what constitutes rights violative actions? And I summarize this by saying, when does your action constitute a violation of my rights? When does your inaction constitute a violation of rights? Okay, and so let's walk through some examples here. Let's say that my, my Joe Rudman, we've been friends for many years, but let's say Joe, just he's finally decided he wants our relationship to be non-photonic. He basically, you know, he just, he, he, Yes, that's, it, I should have had the snare drum out and given you a rim shot on that. He wants it to be completely non-photonic. Well, if I shine a flashlight on, 
You know, th those photon dead gummit, they're hitting him at the speed of light. They're banging into him. Am I violating his rights? Now, we, we, you know, we, we laugh at this, but I, I put a related example here. A few years ago in Albemarle County, where I hang my hat, there, the Board of Supervisors proposes a so-called light ordinance. The idea was, let's say that you have a, an automobile dealership on Route 29. Many automobile dealerships have these big floodlights. Well, the idea was we would, we would impose a requirement that they should be shielded so that the light did not project upwards. It could project downwards, but it would not project upwards. And in Albemarle County, we actually have a small observatory south of, uh, of Charlottesville. It's run by the University of Virginia. And if you start thinking about it, you know, my initial reaction was sort of knee-jerk. Well, this is another example of which there are many of the Board of Supervisors overreaching. But if you think about it, you know, maybe there's something here. For example, do I have a right to go out and put in my backyard an incredibly bright searchlight that's on all the time? Well, I'm not sure that I do. So there are, there are some very interesting issues. If I shine a flashlight or if my bad breath, you know, the bad breath molecules waft over and bang into this young man here. You know, am I, am I engaging in sort of, sort of rights violated action? All right. One of the big issues for us concerns situations where there might be some type of action we might take, which in and of itself would probably not be regarded as rights violative. But if you aggregate these actions, there may be deleterious consequences. And the one that immediately comes to mind is, is there some sort of anthropogenic, that's the fancy way of saying human-induced, global warming? In other words, if I'm the only guy what has an internal combustion engine, it's not you know, like this, and I crank it up, the affluent that comes out of that internal combustion engine, I don't know that too many people are going to claim that my just cranking it up on my property is really violating their behavior or violating their rights. But what happens if you have billions of internal combustion engines cranking up and either by virtue of something that might actually be noxious to human beings or something that might be, if not noxious to human beings, if we have too much of it, it raises the temperature in some fashion for the planet, are we engaged in actions that are violating the rights of people? And if so, how might we deal with that? And I think the issue of the possibility of at least anthropogenerated global warming, I think this is a serious problem for us. Now, by the way, just, just to, identify my, to identify myself fully here, I tend to be one of those who's sort of like Pat Michaels, former state climatologist, Virginia, I think global warming is occurring. I think there's probably some aspect of the nature of the warming that is attributable to human action. I don't know how much it is. I'm not sure that even if there is human action taking place, it's necessarily going to be on net bad, uh, at least to human beings, whether it's bad to other species, that's a, that's a different consideration. And even if human activity is causing global warming, non-trivial global warming, it's not clear that anything we do other than slaughtering large numbers of human beings or basically shutting down industrial activity and making large numbers of people poor is actually going to have any impact. In fact, I'm not sure that there's any real impact that we can have. Uh, as an aside, I don't think really the science is, is, is settled on this as to whether, because of the, the enormous number of feedback mechanisms in terms of most climatologists really don't understand what's going to go on. They apply some basic physics principles, which are in and of themselves okay, but there's so many aspects to, the, to, the, to global warming that I, I don't think the sort of alarmism that we sometimes see is fair. But I also think there are many libertarians who dismiss global warming as, at best, something that is vastly overblown and, at worst, an out-and-out hoax. I think that's unfair too. I think we have to. I think we have to be scrupulously fair and honest in terms of our scientific evaluation. I think ultimately, by the way, the issue of global warming, anthropogenic global warming, is a scientific question, not a political question. All right. In terms of property rights and violations of property rights, in the sense of rights violative actions, there are many people who say that certain types of transactions, certain types of actions that we have are not properly priced in a marketplace. And in fact, I just got back from Stockholm, Sweden, where the price of gasoline is considerably more expensive. Same thing in Iceland. I was in Reykjavik. 
There are many people who believe that the market price of gasoline that we pay at the pump here does not reflect the full social cost of using internal combustion engines. And they would like to see us move to pricing gasoline at full social cost. Now, there are lots of, there are lots of difficulties with that perspective, by the way, because how do you know what the true social cost is? Essentially, what people seem to be doing is simply asserting their values. Um, but I think they at least, on a, on a theoretical level, raise a perfectly reasonable point that we need to, to address in some fashion. If we wish to address potential problems with such a thing as, say, anthropogenerated global warming, it very well may be that what we want to do is to use some sort of common law approach as opposed to a statutory law approach. Although, again, it's, it's, I suspect we have to look at these in terms of case-by-case -case basis. John Hosnes, some of you may know Professor Hosnes. Uh, he frequently lectures at Institute for Humane Studies uh, seminars. He is a professor of philosophy and a professor of law, and he's talked about using the common law to deal with the sort of problems that we sometimes see where, again, an action in and of itself is not considered rights violated, but when you aggregate it over lots and lots of people or lots and lots of, of times, you actually do have deleterious consequences. What about the notion of prior restraint? Do I have the right to essentially stop you from taking certain types of actions that might have dangerous consequences? And I bring up explicitly the question of, is the notion of reckless endangerment, and there, some of you may be familiar with the law, at least in Western countries, there is a notion of reckless endangerment. And is that the way we might want to approach this? And some examples, let's say that I, I'm pointing a pistol at you. Do I have, do I, do you have to wait until I pull the trigger before you take any sort of action? What if I fire a bullet over your shoulder and you say, wait a minute, you're shooting, no, I'm not. I'm, I wasn't shooting at you. I was just trying to demonstrate just how close I could put a bullet to your shoulder without hitting you. <laughs> Are there actions that, in some sense, do not actually violate your rights, but are actions that we might want to prohibit, or perhaps actions that indicate some sort of intent to commit rights-violated actions? Okay. So I think we need, to, we, need to, we need to consider these. Let's say that my property is a breeding ground for a disease like mosquitoes, nasty, yucky mosquitoes that are bearing all sorts of nasty diseases. And, you know, these mosquitoes fly hither and yon. Do you have a right to force me to take some sort of action? Or do you have a right to take action yourself, like dumping some chemical on my pond to kill the mosquitoes? By the way, these are major questions. Some of you may, be, uh, some of you may have heard about uh, the issue of malathion in California, when, when they sprayed malathion basically to deal with certain types of nasty bugs that might destroy the uh, various agricultural crops in California. Let's say that we have a situation where perhaps there is some sort of action that can be taken by people in another country, another community, where once they deploy the weapon, there's essentially nothing you can do except bury your dead. There's really nothing you can do to stop that weapon from causing lots and lots of destruction. So let's say we have a situation, we pick a country at random, oh, I don't know, like Cuba, where somebody has lots and lots of, they put lots and lots of missiles, and we see that pretty darn, darn good opportunity that they're going to push the button and fire those missiles and kill lots of people in Florida or Washington, D.C. Are we allowed <coughs> to take any sort of preemptive action? I, by the way, I'll, 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 I'll say the answer. I think the answer is yes. I think that in situations like that, if there's a clear, if there's a clear intention to commit uh, crimes, uh, aggressive uh, behavior of that sort, I don't think you have to wait around till the bomb actually uh, hits. Another type of challenge, and this is one which, within certain parts of the libertarian community, this is hotly debated. I think libertarians need to deal with this more generally. I think more people need to think about this. What are the rights of children? Because children, the relationship between children and parents is not really a market interaction. Usually when we think in terms of the libertarian perspective applied, we usually, 
I say we, the royal we, we usually are thinking about interactions, market interactions, if you will, between adults, hopefully consenting adults. But what are the, what the arrangement between children and parents, at least as far as I'm aware, is not a contractual arrangement. I didn't ask my mommy and daddy to bring me into the world. Now, I'm, I, I'm glad they did, uh, and I like my mommy and daddy. I think they're, I wanted the best, and that's what I got. But I didn't, I didn't have any part of the contract. Okay. In talking to libertarians across the United States, indeed across the globe, libertarians vary widely in terms of their notions about what is legitimate in terms of the actions of parents toward their children. Let's say that I spank my daughter. I'm not married. I don't have any children, so this is, this is completely hypothetical. If I were to spank my daughter, am I violating her rights? Come on in. Does the answer depend upon why I spank you? Now, I will note that my dad, who by the grace of God is still around, uh, when I was very young, my dad felt that I had showed insufficient courtesy to a neighbor. To teach me a lesson, he applied a hairbrush to what at that time was a very sensitive part of my anatomy. It's still somewhat sensitive, but I'm, spankings are not necessarily something to be feared these days, depending upon who administers them. <laughs> so, what, was my father guilty of child abuse? Because, you know, he spanked me real hard. Didn't cause any lasting physical damage, and I learned the lesson real good, if you'll excuse the colloquialism. What if my daughter is playing around a hot stove, and because little children are very inquisitive, my, I'm scared my daughter is going to put her hand on top of the hot stove, or I'm scared my son is going to chase his soccer ball into the street and get, get creamed by a fast-moving automobile, or even a slow-moving automobile. My son or daughter might understand a spank, and that spank might keep them from getting badly hurt. But it, am I, by engaging in any sort of physical uh, interaction of that sort with my children, am I committing some sort of violation of their rights? Do I have an obligation to care for my children? Most people, by the way, seem to say yes. Most libertarians would say yes. Well, I, I, not all. Not all. If so, until when? I mean, do, let's say that I don't like you. you I, doggone it, you've decided you're going to vote for the wrong person when you reach 18. You learned the wrong lessons that I was trying to teach you about liberty. So I'm going to kick you out of the house at 15. Is that wrong? If I have an obligation to feed my children, must I feed them well? I don't know. I would hope to feed them well, but must I? What if, by the way, this is not a trivial matter. What happens if my children, if some healthcare worker comes in and says, you know, Dr. Lark, that diet of Yoo-Hoo and Mountain Dew, um, you know, you're, you may like it, but it's not good for your children. What if I'm not feeding them a nutritious diet? What, what if, if they're not getting enough nutrients that likely would help them grow to, to good health in adulthood? What if I am driving a car and I've got my son or daughter with me? Do I have to take special precautions? My son or daughter doesn't have, a, doesn't have a choice in whether that son or daughter will be riding with me. And children, by the way, they have a tendency, if they're not belted, if you, know, you stop suddenly, they're going to bang into the dashboard or to the, to the windshield. It's not going to be very pleasant for anybody. So do I need to put them in a special seat? Or can I be considered violating their, their rights if I don't put them in a special seat? By the way, uh, some of you may be familiar with you know, airbags. There was a lot of controversy not all that long ago about the fact that airbags deploy and they, can, they actually can kill. In fact, Tim Slagle, the libertarian comedian, says, if, have you ever seen the commercials for airbags? They're almost always, you show them in slow motion and you see this nice, almost pillow-like airbag gently emerging and your face sort of nestles into this, this, this lovely pillow-like affair. What they sometimes 
will show you is that, of course, the airbag, it comes out to actually like it's been shot out of a shotgun. It does not, it, it's not one of those nice billowy, soft pillow things. It comes out and basically assaults you. <laughs> now, frankly, I'd rather get hit by the airbag than by something a lot harder. But that airbag is not a nice, soft, billowy pillow. And it very well may be that in some cases the safety precautions may actually cause more problems than they solve. I, if you want me to discuss this, bring me back and I'll talk about uh, warning, governmentally mandated safety measures may be hazardous to your health <laughs> on one of my other talks. What about parents and vaccinations? In many places you are required to have your children vaccinated against various diseases. And frankly, by virtue of mandatory vaccinations, We've largely wiped out certain types of diseases in this country that killed millions. However, we also have a non-trivial record of children who were vaccinated who became badly, badly damaged by the vaccinations. So do, should parents be required, should children be required to be vaccinated? Let's say a woman decides that she wants to use some Re drug for recreational, recreational purposes, and let's say that there's, there's good evidence, we, we agree on the scientific evidence, that that use endangers, and again I use either fetus or unborn child, use your favorite term, can that sort of drug use constitute a violation of rights because you're injuring, potentially you're injuring another person. And again, many of you are aware a lot of, a lot of laws that have been contemplated deal with exactly that issue. There have actually been situations where women have been prosecuted for actions that have damaged or were thought to have damaged the unborn child or fetus, again, depending upon your, your, your terminology. What about age of consent laws? We have age of consent laws in all sorts of contexts. Are they legitimate? And if so, how would you determine the appropriate age for such laws? What about laws involving child labor? Does it, make a, does it make a difference whether the labor is considered dangerous or not? You know, if, if little Johnny or little Janie doesn't really have a choice of whether going off, you know, mommy and daddy say, look, Johnny, you know, we're kind of poor and you need to go off and help the family survive, so you're going to take this highly dangerous job picking slate as it comes out of a coal chute. You could lose your hand that way. Is there, is there any scope for for any sort of laws that would regulate the employment of children. Again, a lot of, lot of interesting and, in my opinion, difficult questions with which to deal. Finally, uh, I'll talk about what I call sensible coercion. Okay, there, is a, there is now a fairly substantial intellectual movement that tries to identify ways in which we can engage in what some people will call libertarian paternalism sensible coercion because we can get superior outcomes okay the question more formally is can forcing everyone to take a particular action can it actually produce an outcome that each individual participant would say yeah this is a better outcome than what we're likely to get through market interactions and i mentioned thomas schelling's example of hockey helmets thomas schelling is a professor i don't know if he's still a professor of economics at now university of maryland he won a nobel prize in economics, and he, he wrote one, I think, one of the more interesting papers in economics about hockey helmets. Now, you're probably thinking, what, what, you know, if you watch the NHL, guys are wearing hockey helmets, okay? It used to be, though, most players, in fact, very few players wore hockey helmets. It wasn't because hockey helmets weren't around. They just didn't wear them because, in the words of some of the players, if you wore a hockey helmet, you would be marked as a sissy. Now, by the way, sissy is not the five-letter word with two S's sort of midway in, ending in a Y that was being used. <laughs> That's the polite word. The idea was you didn't want to put on a hockey helmet unless you were absolutely forced to because you would be looked at as a <coughs> soft mark and the other team's goons would come in and make a point of trying to, to smash you into the sideboard. So, the point that Shelley made was, and it's a very interesting point, the NHL required hockey players to start wearing helmets. And the hockey players, at least some of them, would talk, said, you know, thank God they did. Because I always wanted to wear the hockey helmet 
But if I did, if I did it on my own, if I was the first one to wear a hockey helmet, I would have ended up getting smashed into the sideboards all the time. So the players themselves actually thought it was a good idea, but no one wanted to be the first one to wear the hockey helmet. So Schelling raised some very interesting questions, and other people have come along and suggested that there might be situations where coercion of some sort, forcing people to do something, might produce not only better outcomes, but better outcomes in the eyes of the people who are being forced. Of course, a lot of justification for forcing people to have Social Security. There are some institutions in Chile, for example, where you have to have some sort of old age provision for your, for your old age. And the idea is that if we don't force people to do it, there'll be free riders, and yes, we might talk about we're not going to cut people, you know, we're going to cut people off if they don't buy their own insurance, if they don't buy their own, uh, you know, some sort of insurance policy or some sort of provision for their old age. But in reality, we really won't. So what we need to do is we need to force them. What about so-called public goods? If we don't have taxation, Will we have enough so-called public goods? National defense is sort of the quintessential example. Now, inc incidentally, when people talk about public goods, and I, I point out sort of the classic definition here of a public good, uh, the, the fancy way of saying a public good is one that has properties of being non-rivalrous and non-excludable, which means if I consume the public good, it doesn't preclude you from being able to, to use it or to consume it. Also, if you don't pay for it, there's no way I can exclude you from being able to avail yourself of it. And the idea is, for example, national defense is a public good. A couple of points here. Public goods arguments are used all the time to justify big government. And in my opinion, they are badly overused. There are a lot of things that have public goods properties. I don't believe that the justification, just simply saying public goods, allows you to justify big government. Also, in cases such as national defense, people say, well, if we don't have, if we, since it is a, quote, public good, if we don't have taxation, we'll get insufficiently large amounts of it. Well, how do you know? How can you ever tell how much national defense is enough? So there's a certain sense in which they're basically making this argument, and then they're saying, well, we wouldn't have enough. They don't know because we don't know how, enough, how much national defense we need. At any given spending level, you never really know until you find out it, it wasn't enough. So a lot of arguments for public goods, frankly, in my opinion, they have, a, they have a lot of intellectual sloppiness about them. But still, that doesn't mean that we of libertarian disposition don't need to think about them. Because there, there are reasonable questions. What about situations when you have market arrangements between parties where there are huge, what we call, informational asymmetries? In other words, and, and the classic example is George Okunov, another Nobel laureate, by the way, who his famous paper, the so-called Lemons Markets paper, the idea was, I'm a used car dealer. I bought the used cars. I have a lot more information about the imperfections of the used cars than you do. So is the so-called informational asymmetry so great that we're going to have bad outcomes if we don't have some sort of regulation of the market. Regulation meaning that I, as a dealer, I have to disclose certain information to you. Now, incidentally, there are market mechanisms that basically encourage people to provide information in situations where you have huge informational asymmetries. And there are various organizations, for example, Consumer Reports and the like, um, that actually have market news. By the way, I'm thinking about buying a new, a new car, a new used car. I, I always buy my cars used because the depreciation curves are so ridiculously steep on new cars. So I always buy my cars used. I'm now looking at, of course, now with the internet, you can search all over the country and find cars. Of course, the first thing, what do I want before I actually get serious about buying a car? I want the Carfax. Now show me the Carfax. Trust me. Show me the car facts. This is a market response to informational asymmetries. You don't have to have coercion. But there are still issues. I think that we should think through to say, wait a minute, are there situations where we really do want to try to mandate some sort of mechanism whereby when buyers and sellers come together, people have to reveal certain information in order to generate better outcomes? You may be familiar with a book that has become fairly popular among the governing classes, 
it's entitled Nudge. It's by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunston. Richard Thaler is a longtime professor of economics. Many of you may have encountered some of his textbooks. Cass Sunston, uh, law professor, now uh, advisor to uh, President Obama on all sorts of things. They wrote a book entitled Nudge, and the idea is can we, by virtue of forcing people politely, nicely, can we actually improve outcomes? And, for example, health care. Do we actually improve the health care system by forcing people to have health insurance? Okay. The idea, of course, if we don't force them is that you might have a situation where, oh, I don't know, young people, young and healthy people like you might not buy insurance until it's too late. Okay. And by the way, these, these, are, these are reasonable questions. I don't agree with the approach that, uh, and the conclusions that many people come to. But I think these are serious questions, and that if we want to, if we do want to promote the libertarian perspective, if we want to see a society move in the direction of individual liberty and personal responsibility, I think it behooves us at least to think things through, so that if nothing else, we recognize why people are making these arguments. Because most of the people who are making these arguments, first of all, are very bright people. I wish they were stupid, but they're not. They're very bright people, and they raise reasonable questions. So I think that we need to be able to engage them. All right. Just as a side point about this, whenever people start talking about nudging, that we can bring about good results, in fact, they would claim better results, in some cases, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to actually be able to compare, uh, compare good and bad. Because damn near every government action, the good results are observable. The bad results, what, what, what happens is bad, in many cases is not observable and may not be realized until way down the road. So you may have differences. In other words, benefits are realized immediately. Costs are not realized until well after the benefits are realized. So with those problems, it's very difficult to actually have a real honest-to-God valid comparison of regulatory regimes. So some of the references I have, I mentioned George Okolov's famous paper, his QJE paper, Henry George, John Locke, the sort of Locke-in perspective. And by the way, I'll be happy to provide these, uh, these references. Tom Schelling's paper about hockey helmets, uh, Thaler and, Cun and Sunston's book on Nudge. And so with that, thank you for taking the time and trouble to be here. If you have any questions, comments, arguments, and want to get in touch with me, my email address is jwlark at virginia.edu, and I'm happy to uh, respond. It may take me a while because the backlog seems to be increasing, but I will hopefully respond to you in finite time. And with that, I'll open up.